Welcome to Richard's How To's Part 10. Glad you can be here listening to this today. And we're going to look at the subject, how to encourage, how to encourage. And isn't it that needed in the church today and amongst the people of God today to encourage one another, especially in the days that we're in, the last days. And we can all struggle at times through life with issues of life. And so we all need encouragement through our Christian walk in different seasons and at different times. So let's look at the Word of God together. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, Be patient towards all men. I'll read that again. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient towards all men. And a lot of the time in church, we look to the minister, we look to the leaders, we, we look to these key people in a congregation and we want to receive encouragement. We go to the meetings, whether that's online, whether that's at the church building itself, and we want to receive encouraging uh, words from the pastor, from the leader. And that's great and that's wonderful. But the reality is there's not just a corporate encouragement that's needed there's a personal encouragement that's also needed in the church and Paul and his ministry team saying we exhort you and he begins to list three major areas to the congregation to do for one another and 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 this is a one another ministry because Paul isn't saying I'm going to encourage everybody all the time no he's exhorting them to encourage one another in the days that they're in. And so we need to take heed to that, to realize we are our brother's keeper. The Bible is very clear about that. In our seeking God, we also have to seek and look out for our brother. In loving God, we have to love our brother and sister in Christ. We have to be there to look out for one another, especially in these days. And we can't be people who just seek God, but don't seek the benefit for our brother and sister. We can't be people who just love God, but don't love our brethren. And so this is part of the expression of the love of Christ through our hearts, one to each other. And that is, we begin to learn to comfort one another. So let's continue to look at this. You know, the word feeble-minded, it says comfort the feeble-minded, isn't the best word. It really means comfort the faint-hearted. And so let's call it faint-hearted. That's what the Greek means, faint-hearted. And if you look at the natural of when a person faints, you know, sometimes you watch these video programs, don't you? And you, 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 we laugh, don't we, when we see like maybe a bride or a bridegroom suddenly faint or a soldier who's been standing in the blazing sun all day in London and all of a sudden he faints onto the ground. But that is really the final moment when the body or the person can't take the pressure, whether it's an inward pressure of worry and anxiousness like at some of these weddings or whether it's like that soldier who's been in the heat of the day for so long and suddenly his body can no longer take that heat, that pressure physically. So you've got emotional pressure and you've got physical pressure but it results sometimes to a point where it's too much for them to bear and suddenly their body gives up and they faint and fall to the ground. Well, also in the Christian walk and in the Christian faith and in churches and in congregations, there can be people who are ready to faint. And the Bible says, comfort the faint-hearted. And this is not something that's physical. This is something that's inward because it says faint-hearted. And sometimes there are Christians all around us that are having difficulty, having worries, having cares of life, and they're struggling through on their own, trying to come up 
up with solutions, trying to pray things through, trying to find solutions in the Lord, or think they failed, or you know they haven't got enough faith, or why have I got this problem? Why is the enemy doing this to me? And their minds are going in complete turmoil. Well, the answer, folks, is really us. Us as brethren, us as people of God, to be there for one another, to encourage one another. And so let us not wait until the final push where the heat of the problem, the pressure of the moment causes them to be fainting, faint-hearted, to fall to the ground, to stumble in the faith, to give up on walking with the Lord or give up in their soul, their, their problem and, 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 and be, begin to get so anxious that they become troubled in mind and heart. And we don't want that as people of God. We recognize though that this happens. This is a problem that will at times in everybody's life happen. We worry about things, we fear things, but there's nothing like having a brother or a sister in Christ being there to encourage you, on you also to be an encouragement through that time and through that season. And so we must learn to comfort the faint hearted. So it is our responsibility. We are our brother's keeper. And that's really step one to being a great encourager is take responsibility for encouraging. Don't wait. Don't think, can I? Don't think, should I? Begin to take that responsibility. Don't just be part of a, a congregation where you're not thinking about others. It's so important that we take step one, that responsibility, not just for the pastor, but we take responsibility that we are going to be an encourager in the church of Jesus Christ, hallelujah. And so in taking responsibility, we must also, step two, take opportunity. So we take responsibility, but we also take opportunity. And the opportunities are all around us every day. Whether we go to a meeting or we're not going to a meeting, whether we, you know, we've got phones, we've got emails, we've got communications all around us. And so we can be very prayerful, we can be very mindful. So we're taking responsibility through our day on who you can encourage, who you can be an encouragement to. You take that responsibility and then you learn to take opportunity. And, and that's key. We, we don't want to shrink back from taking opportunity. And a lot of the times we can leave it and think, no, I won't do it today. I won't phone that person. I won't encourage that person. I won't say anything today. I'll leave it till next week. And then next week comes and then we'll leave it again to next week. And sometimes we can procrastinate. And, but really, you know, we are missing an opportunity. So I, I encourage you today to be an encourager to take responsibility step one step two take responsibility but encouraging really means as well that we are reminders reminders Paul says warn them that are unruly and that seems very serious doesn't it and in some ways it is, but it, it, it's somebody who's going, struggling on the path, is going away from the path, deviating from the path of the Lord, and somebody can come in and, and bring caution. But also, you know, this word warning seems to be harsh, doesn't it? And it really, in the Greek, is not a harsh word, because in reality, this word warn means this, exhort, put in mind, put in caution and reprove gently, reprove gently, because we all need gentleness in our life, we can react badly if somebody comes in with, with such aggression, and, and encouragement is an aggression, even this scripture where it says warning is an aggression, it means to reprove gently, it means to bring caution to a person's life. And that's not making people do what you want them to do. It's just reminding. It's a word of reminding people the ways of the Lord. And so 
So encouraging means reminding, and we all need reminding, don't we? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, in, in the scriptures where Peter says, "I put you in remembrance," because we do forget things, and when we're struggling, when people are struggling or anxious or worried, and they're starting to deviate from the path of the Lord, they need reminding of the goodness of the Lord. They need reminding of who they are in Jesus Christ. So part of our encouragement, step three, is learn to remind people of the Lord Jesus Christ. Begin to remind people of who they are in Christ. If they seem to be deviating from the path of the Lord, you know, kind of get your arm around them, get your words around them, and begin to bring caution by reminding them gently of what the Lord has done for them and who the Lord is in them and who they are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And and Paul did this throughout the scriptures. An example of this is the Corinthian church. When the Corinthian church was going off their own way, they were deviating from the Lord because of the pressures of culture and living out culture, even in sinful ways. Paul came, didn't he, as that father in Christ and, and he, he brought a gentle reminder. He says, know ye not that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and so he's reminding them, you know, rem- don't you know? And he's, of course, they've been taught by Paul. What he's doing is he's gently nudging them, gently reminding them of who they are in Jesus Christ. So first we take we, we take responsibility. Second, we take opportunity. Third, we gently remind people as they're struggling about who they are in Jesus Christ through gentle reminders. So, also the scripture here talks about comforting the faint-hearted. So, how does the, does this encouragement and being an encourager relate to comfort? comforting people in their issues and in their problems. Well, one of the words for comfort means to relate to, to relate to. And so, you know, there's no way around it. Sometimes in church culture, we shake hands, we say hello, we say goodbyes, we've no real relation. And meetings alone don't do this. Relationships are built. Relationships means taking again that opportunity. If you take that opportunity to be an encourager, you will relate, begin to relate to people. You will, because you're actively encouraging people and there will be a response from the people you are encouraging. And so you begin to relate so that your fellowship is not just words, it's real action in people's lives. But the word comfort as well really does mean that we have to speak to people. That, you know, sometimes we can get worried about speaking to people. And so we must learn to speak. We must learn to say. We must learn to converse. You know, and you think, well, I'm not very confident. Just start. Just begin. Just begin to relate through conversation. It's amazed when you talk to people, when you listen to people, what you begin to find out about their lives, about their struggles, about their worries, about their cares. And, and really, this is part of comforting. Being a good listener as well is key to being an encourager. Because if you listen to people, you can find where they're at in life. You can find where their problem is. So you, they don't have to, as I related before in that picture, where a person faints. You can stop that from happening. You can be preventive by beginning to speak to people, listening to people, and letting them talk. Let Letting them get off the chest certain things so then you can begin to fill their life with reminders of who they are in Christ Jesus, gentle reminders and also reminders of what can be done in their issue, in their problem, in their fear. And so comfort also means bringing calm to people's lives and so we're not there to stir up even more anguish. And this is what I call the comparison syndrome. And and, and oftentimes 
Christians try and comfort one another by comparing. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's an old film now, but Jaws. And I remember a scene in Jaws when I'm on, they're on the boat, the three main characters, and one shows a, a scar where a shark had bit him. And then the other one gets his leg out and shows a bigger scar. And then the other one gets an arm out and shows the scar. And all they're doing is comparing of how they've been bit, how they've been eaten, how they've been attacked. And so sometimes in comforting each other, we can be in a situation where all we do is compare one another with our issues and our fears, but with no solution, with no direction, with no relating to Christ. And we shouldn't do that. We, we don't want to compound people's fears even more, do we? Because they might think, well, if we're struggling, they're struggling, we're all struggling with no way out and with no solution to the problem. So I want to encourage you, don't go into the comparison syndrome. You're there for them. You are listening, you are speaking, you are encouraging them. Of course, we need encouragement too, but it, and it will be reciprocal, but don't get into the comparison issue because that doesn't bring solution to the problem. We can share testimonies, but testimonies are different, aren't they? Because testimonies have a solution. They have an happy ending. They have where the Lord has brought us through and brought us out. It also means that we are to speak constructively and directively. And, and sometimes that's what we need to do as well. We need to be constructive. Admonition is means to be constructive. We construct one another in the faith and on the faith. And that's key. You know, we, we are to construct on a foundation. And so when we are encouraging each other, it mustn't be with our word. It must be with his word. And as I've already said, it must be what Christ has done. What Christ has done and what he's done within the believer. That's our foundation. He's our cornerstone. So when we're encouraging people and relating words and speaking, let us learn to speak the word of God one to another and encourage one another with his word instead of just our words. Hallelujah. The word also means comfort. It also means, uh, you know, it means to be able to bring incentive. And, and that's a key thing. When somebody who's struggling, somebody who's deviating, somebody who feels faint-hearted, they need an incentive to continue, don't they? They need direction, but they need incentives to keep on moving forward. Sometimes people can get stuck in a hole, as it were, stuck in a pit. And so we need to bring that incentive to move things forward. And so that means we pray together, we ask for wisdom together, and that's key. Again, this is relationship, isn't it? This is relating to a person. This isn't just listening to a person and saying goodbye. This is saying, let's pray together about this. Let's seek the solution about this. Let's speak the words of God to encourage one another about this issue or let's go and find help together about this issue it's so key to to moving forward to be a great encourager and that sometimes means you can't really wait to the next service you need to phone you need to text you need to be there to help that person doesn't it and so let's be that kind of encourager that doesn't just go from one Sunday to the next or one month to the next or one year to the next. Let's be there for each other, practically speaking, but also praying and finding solution together. But the scripture finally also says support the weak support the weak and we can all be weak at times this isn't about being a superstar christian we can all have different areas of our life that are weak that are unstable that we feel where we're going to fall but the, the the scripture says and it's quite interesting this word support it means to stand in oppos opposite 
with care. It means to cleave to. And that's key, isn't it? Because again, this is just more than just words. It's more than just a handshake. It means that you stand in front of a person stand in front of them and you cleave to them it's like a big hug and that isn't just a hug and then let go this is an illustrative word to say we're not letting you go we're going through this together we're speaking together we're praying together we're finding solutions together i'm not going to leave it till next year before i speak to you again through this problem we're in it together we cleave to each other and so being an encourager means time it really does mean time you give time to cleave to to hold on to to adhere with care for that person and say i'm not letting you go i'm not giving up you're not giving up we are finding the incentive to move forward who is jesus christ we're going to find the solution to the problem the solution to the fear we're going to get through this together and that's what being a real encourager means and so I hope this has been helpful, that we learn to take responsibility for encouragement. We learn to take our opportunity for being an encouragement. We begin to comfort one another, warn each other with gentle reminders. So we remind each other of the truth of in Christ Jesus. We give people incentive to move forward rather than condemnation. We begin not to have our fear comparisons, but we bring constructive, with constructive help and constructive direction. And we learn to adhere to each other and say, we're not letting each other go. We're getting through this together. So I hope this has been a help to you in learning to how to be an encouragement or an encourager in the faith. So until next time on Richard's How-Tos, God bless you.